Welcome to Financial Management. Chapter 1 is an overview, but it's a very important chapter because it underlies everything that we are going to be learning about this semester. Chapter 1 tells us what financial management is and it focuses on the role of the financial manager. What we're going to learn about during the rest of the semester speaks to that role and unpacks the role. So I want you to keep remembering, remind yourself to come back to chapter one and consider at each stage how does the topic that we're dealing with fit into the role that we have spoken about right from the start. In this se series of slide presentations, you will see that on each page, there are question numbers in the right-hand corner or sometimes the left-hand corner. I've tried to identify from your prescribed textbook which questions relate to which issue on which slide of the presentation and I've indicated that on the slides. So just bear that in mind please if you are looking at a particular slide and so it's dealing with a particular issue you would be able to refer to those certain questions that I identified on that slide in your book and you would be able to then attempt the question and go and review the solution and use that as learning material to improve your understanding on that issue. Okay, so let's move on to the first slide. What is the point of financial management? So the fundamental objective of financial management is to ensure that the return to shareholders is maximized. The return to shareholders is maximized. So we are focusing on shareholders. The job of the financial manager is to make sure that the wealth of the shareholders is growing. So if your return is maximized, the growth, that which the shareholders own, is going to be increasing. So how does the financial manager do this? by making decisions that will result in returns to the company that exceed the cost of capital. So let's just think about that for a moment. A company makes investments and earns returns. Returns are flowing towards the company. In order to be able to make an investment, the company needs capital. So where does capital come from? Capital can either be equity, which comes from shareholders, or can be in the form of debt finance. Debt finance and equity both have associated costs. Equity has the expectation that the shareholder has that they are going to earn a certain level of reward. Debt finance has the interest charge associated with that debt. So let's just read the sentence again. By making decisions which result in returns, that's towards the company, that exceed the cost of capital. That's the combined capital, your debt capital and your equity capital. Okay, so we're talking about maximizing shareholders' wealth. Let's just consider how do shareholders actually realize that wealth? If the shareholder's wealth is growing, how can we determine whether their wealth is growing and how can they realize that growth? So there are two ways. They can receive a dividend. That's one way of them receiving and realizing. To realize means to translate into cash, basically, right? 
to make it come real for the shareholders. So they can receive a dividend. That's one indication. And another indication is that the share price of those shares that they own has increased. So when the share price increases, the shareholders' wealth is increasing. And when they sell their share and receive the cash, they will be realizing that appreciation in the value of their shares. The value of the business will increase if capital is raised at the lowest possible cost and applied to investments yielding the highest possible return. So that should make logical sense to us. We want investments that are going to yield a high return but we want to pay the least possible costs of capital. If the yield on the investment is greater than the cost of capital, we're going to have a net positive, which means the value of the business will increase. So high returns for low costs results in increased value. The role of the financial manager is all about making decisions. So the two key decisions, the fundamental areas that the financial manager is looking at is what investments is the company going to invest in and where is it going to get its capital from? What are the sources of finance that the company is going to use? So in the previous slides, we've been talking about the fact that we want investments that are going to yield a higher return than the cost of the capital, the cost of the finance that's being employed to purchase that investment, to finance that investment. Okay, so on the one hand, the financial manager needs to identify investments to invest in. And on the other hand, the financial manager needs to determine how are we going to pay for these investments. What sources of finances are available to us? Are we going to use equity finance or are we going to use debt finance? Okay, so let's look first at, I think we're going to look at the investments first. The financial manager, when looking at investments and making decisions on what investments to consider, they need to ascertain whether at that particular point in time the company is more interested or more needing operating assets or are they able to and in a position to invest in financial assets. So operating assets are assets that produce the products or the services which generate the firm's income. That's different to financial assets. The term financial assets should be ringing a bell to you because you've learned about this in financial reporting. Financial assets are shares in another company where the shareholder does not acquire operational control of the underlying assets. So they are not a majority shareholder, not a consolidation scenario. It's simply an investment in another company which does not attract operational control of the underlying assets. So when the financial manager is deciding on what investment projects to undertake. There is a decision process that is undertaken. First, they need to evaluate the risk. Is there a potential for loss? What is that potential? What is the risk that the company is going to lose on the project? What uncertainty surrounds future returns and future cash flows? The financial manager needs to take these into account and then needs to evaluate what is the value 
of that investment. To determine the value of the investment, we need to take into consideration the time value of money. You're all familiar with the time value of money principles from your statistics course. The timing of cash flows affects their value. So something that you can buy for a rand today, you won't be able to buy for a rand in five years' time. It will cost you more than a rand in five years' time. So the present value of a future amount is always less than that future amount. So in order for us to evaluate the value of a project, an investment project, we need to know or we need to estimate what are the future cash flows. We work them out for each year that we have budgeted those future cash flows for. Once we have a total for each of those years, we must present value those totals to get to the present day value, which we call a current value. So when we cover capital budgeting, one of our later chapters, we must remind ourselves that capital budgeting is this process of evaluating the value of the investment project so that we can then do the next step, which is compare the value to the cost. So if the net present value, so that's our current day value of future cash flows, is 2 million rand, but the project is going to cost us 3 million rand. Does it make sense to spend 3 million rand on something that is going to bring in cash flows which we can present value at only 2 million? That wouldn't make sense. So our first step is to ascertain whether the value of the project exceeds the cost of the project. If it does, then we can take it to the next step where we're going to actually act on this decision to invest. And at this point, we're going to try and obtain finance. Taking a step backwards, let's just remind ourselves of the previous slide, where we were evaluating the risk. The second bullet there, the second box says uncertainty surrounding future returns and cash flows must be evaluated. So the financial manager needs to be aware of risks that are at the company level. If you look on the left hand side in red we have three levels. The company level, the national level and the international level. So our assessment of risk and return needs to respond to variables in the economic and political landscape at those three levels. So at the company level, we need to consider what are the growth prospects of the company? What diversification prospects are there? Competitive forces, who are the competitors? What are the barriers to entry? What's the likelihood of a takeover? And so on. Then at the national level, what about inflation? How is inflation expected to affect uh, the risk aspect of a project? What are the expected interest rates, foreign exchange rates, political sentiment? What about money supply? And on the international front, what is the situation with the world economy? For example, now after COVID-19, the world at large is in economic difficulty not just isolated countries. What about trading partners and agreements, trade agreements that exclude certain countries, that include certain countries? What about offshore finance? Is offshore finance available or is it off the table? And international interest rates. These are aspects that the financial manager needs to make sure that he or she is aware of and is regularly keeping him or herself up to date with current affairs.
the formula at the bottom of the page says that the required return on a project is the risk free rate plus the risk premium. Now this required return is the returns required by shareholders. It's the risk free rate, that is the risk free rate in the marketplace, plus the risk premium for that particular entity. This formula is called CAPM, the Capital Asset Pricing Model. We're going to learn to calculate this formula and we're going to work extensively with it. Let's consider now whether accounting records are useful for financial management when assessing the value of an opportunity. So we've been saying in the previous slide that we need to assess the value. We need to evaluate the value and then compare the value to the cost. So the question raised now is whether accounting records are useful for this purpose. Can we use accounting records to assess the value of an opportunity? You'll see in the bottom right hand corner there, there are three questions in the textbook that relate to this question. And when you want to delve into this a bit deeper, go and read those questions and read the solutions so that you can unpack all the important information. The annual financial statements of a business are usually generated using the accrual basis on the depreciated historic cost model, and these include accounting estimates. They do not reflect current values and are not immediately useful to financial managers. When we are looking at evaluating the value of a project, we are looking forward. Financial accounting records are looking backward into the past, right? And they include non-cash items. So instead, cash flow projections are used by financial managers to evaluate investment opportunities as well as to arrive at a value for a business. The cash flow projections are discounted, that means we calculate their net present value, as I was describing earlier, to reflect current values using the cost of capital, which includes the cost of all sources of capital. So if some of our capital is from equity, and some of our capital is from debt finance, we are going to need to work out what is the cost of the equity, what's the cost of the debt, and then work out an average, a weighted average across those two to work out what is our overall cost across both sources of finance. We call that our weighted average cost of capital. So each type of capital has a cost, and then when we look at the big picture, the combined picture, we work out what is the weighted average cost of capital. We then use that weighted average cost of capital to discount the future cash flows to arrive at our current value. And these discounted cash inflows and outflows are not the same as accounting profits and losses. In order to make use of the information recorded in the accounting records, the financial manager must understand the cash flow implications of the accounting policies used in the preparation of the financial statements. Accounting policies often involve the use of estimates and judgment. So the financial manager must understand that so that he can analyze what is the effect of those estimates and judgments on the financial information because perhaps he or she is going to have to adjust the cash flow projections. He or she cannot just base it on historical values because they may have been um, influenced too much by 
estimates or judgments. Profit maximization is problematic as an objective of financial management. Let's think about that for a moment. Profit maximization. One would think that to maximize profit would be a role of the financial manager. But we must not get confused between maximizing profit and maximizing shareholder wealth creation. Profit is an accounting term. Net profit is arrived at after estimates and judgments have been introduced. Accounting profits are often manipulated because of those estimates and judgments. So profit maximization is not going to be the same function as shareholder wealth creation. Timing of returns is also something that is going to affect this concept of profit maximization because the timing of future returns, you cannot say that if a business is going to make a profit of 5 million rand in each of the next five years, that the total at the current day is 25 million. The timing of the returns makes a difference to the net present value. Profit maximization doesn't reflect cash flows. Often there are non-cash items that are used in the calculation of profit. Accounting profits do not account for the cost of equity capital. Think about this. The cost of debt finance is interest. Do we include interest as an expense when we're calculating accounting profit? Yes, we do. Do we have any expense for the cost of equity when we calculate our accounting profits? No, we don't. But we know that there is a cost associated with equity. Our shareholders definitely want a return on their investment. Our accounting profit does not factor that in at all. And rather, we are left to consider what is our return on equity for ourselves once we know what the accounting profits are. Risk. If higher profits came with much higher risk, then the share price may fall. The financial manager needs to consider risk. You can't chase high reward when risks the associated risks are too high because shareholders might get frightened, they might get scared off and that might start dumping shares which will cause your share price to fall. Please make sure that you take some time to consider the difference between profit maximization and shareholder wealth creation and the maximization of shareholder wealth. The next question, why must an investment opportunity be thoroughly investigated before finance for the project is arranged? Now remember, we've spoken about the fact that the financial manager has two decisions. The one decision is about the investments. What investments? Is he or she identifying in order to pursue as a way of creating wealth for shareholders? On the other hand, the financial manager must decide how is this project going to be financed. So this question is asking why must the opportunity, the investment opportunity, be investigated before arranging finance? Why don't we first say, Oh, what finance can we arrange? Okay, we can arrange 40 million rand. Let's look for an opportunity that's going to cost 40 million. We don't do it that way around for a particular reason. 
we have been saying since the start of the chapter that the return on the investment must exceed the cost associated with the capital. So we must first identify the investment opportunity and investigate it thoroughly to work out what is the expected return on that investment. Once we know what the expected return on the investment is, then we can say, right, we know that this project is likely to have a return of 14%. We need to raise finance. We need to make sure that our finance is not going to cost us more than 14%. If the finance is going to cost more than 14%, then we cannot pursue the project. Right, this is just now reminding us that there were two aspects of the decision-making process. We're deciding on what investments to pursue, and then on the right-hand side, we're deciding on the sources of finance. So far, we've been focusing on investments. Now we're going to turn our attention to sources of finance. There are two sources of finance, capital markets, which are long-term sources of funding, and money markets, which are short-term sources of funding. When we use the phrase short-term and the phrase long-term, we use it just like you do in financial reporting. Short-term is referring to a 12-month period, one year. So money market funding is funding that's for the short term it's it's intended to be repaid within 12 months and it's used to meet the needs of cyclical or seasonal fluctuations so a short term loan would be considered a money market source of finance on the other hand Long-term funding, which provides a stable element of finance, so that's equity, debentures, the long-term loan, for example, those are all capital market finance. So we're going to spend some time this semester looking at capital structure decisions. How do we decide how much of our finance is going to come from equity and how much is going to come from debt. Is there an optimal structure? Is there a point at which one becomes more attractive than the other? Those are the questions we're going to be looking at. EVA is a concept where we consider, as I was speaking about earlier, we consider what is the cost of equity and we take operating income and instead of simply arriving at net profit after interest and tax, we also subtract the cost of capital associated with the equity. So we take the invested capital from our shareholders and multiply it by their expected rate of return to work out what is the, in brackets, interest that our shareholders are expecting. And that gets subtracted from operating income to see, well, do we still have a surplus? Do we still have a profit after we've taken off the cost of equity? And that is called our economic value added, EVA. Please remind yourselves of the different forms of business structures in South Africa. These are not going to be tested directly in this module, but all of our case studies involve entities, business entities, because this is a corporate finance course. So when an entity is referred to as a private company, as a partnership, 
or as a sole proprietorship or as a listed company, for example, you are expected to know what that means. Please make sure that that is the case. In financial management and corporate financial management, a situation arises which you've identified and spoken about. You should have discussed this in auditing in a context where you would have been looking at corporate governance and the fact that management acts on behalf of the shareholders who are the owners. This situation where an agent is taking decisions on behalf of the principal is called an agency relationship and it gives rise to an agency problem. The agency problem is whether the agent is in fact operating and taking decisions in the best interests of the owner and what if a possible conflict arises. This is the agency problem. Some mitigating factors to try and deal with this problem is to offer promotions for excellent performance and to try and incentivize staff to perform well because there's a possibility that they may be replaced if they don't. So creating incentives, offering promotions, looking at possible target bonuses, etc., are all mechanisms used to try and reduce the likelihood that the financial manager is not going to act in the best interests of the shareholders. Please make sure that you take a moment to understand how the agency relationship relates to the financial manager. You will have dealt with this under commercial law. You will have dealt with it under auditing. So let's just make sure that you spend a moment considering how this impacts the behavior of the financial manager who is responsible for allocating finance for the company and making decisions which are intended to maximize the shareholder's wealth. Some of the other influences on financial managers, ethics. You've spent a considerable amount of time in your auditing and your business ethics courses, talking about ethics, unpacking, what does it mean to be ethical? Please make sure that you consider that in the context of financial management. What behavior would be unethical of a financial manager? And what behavior is acceptable? You will be faced with questions on ethics as they pertain to financial management. So please do make sure that you understand that ethics is not a topic that is isolated to other modules. Corporate governance and ethics are very interlinked. One of the principles of corporate governance is ethical leadership. And the reputation of a business is very closely linked to its corporate governance practices and on the other hand the reputation of a business is also closely linked to its value and how stakeholders perceive it, how shareholders perceive the company. So that linkage between ethics, corporate governance, reputation and value cannot be denied. And since we're trying to maximize value, it's very important that those other aspects do not get ignored. 
Okay, remember the capital asset pricing model that we spoke about earlier. Financial statement analysis. These will also influence our financial manager because interpretations of financial statements are used by shareholders and by lenders to make decisions about allocation of funds. And remember, those are our two major sources of funds for the business. The efficient market hypothesis is an economic theory which says that any information available in the marketplace has already been taken into account in the share price at any given point in time. So it's kind of closely linked to the no arbitrage principle that no other information can cause somebody to be able to make an unfair have an unfair advantage as regards share pricing. Right, let's just talk about corporate strategy for a moment. The company must have a strategy. So a company without a strategy doesn't have a plan, doesn't have goals and objectives. So part of the corporate strategy must be a consideration of the competitive strategies, what is the company intending to do to make sure that they are competitive. Are they going to implement cost leadership, which means they keep their costs to a bare minimum in order to make sure that they keep costs down, keep their selling price down, and appeal to the market through affordable selling prices? That's one way of getting a competitive advantage. Or is the company going to differentiate themselves from the market by supplying a product that is different to all the other products out there? And often, when that is the case, people, consumers, are willing to pay a premium for something that is differentiated, that stands out amongst the rest. So each company must decide which route are they taking, cost leadership or differentiation, if they are trying to get a competitive advantage. Analysis techniques that are used by management when they are assessing their corporate strategy and making decisions for the future are Pessel's five, Porter's five forces, Pessel analyses and SWOT analyses. So SWOT analyses, I'm sure you are most familiar with, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Pessel analyses, political, environmental, social, technological, economic, and legal. What do each of those, what's happening in the world that relates to each of those categories that may have an impact on the entity that's being considered. And then Porter's five forces, which consider things like customers, suppliers, the level of rivalry amongst existing companies in the sector, so amongst competitors, existence and threat of substitute products, as well as the threat of new entrants. So how do these considerations affect the corporate strategy? How do they affect our plans for the future? So through doing these analyses, management then has an idea of what weaknesses or what threats need to be addressed and they can then leverage their strengths to make the most of the strengths in an attempt to downplay any weaknesses. So the objectives of chapter one 
we're really to set the scene for what we are going to study this semester. You can read through this list. I think that as we unpack the material that we're going to be going through, we must keep coming back to chapter one and it's going to fortify, it's going to strengthen your understanding of this role that the financial manager has and the link to the corporate strategy, why the decisions that are being taken are so fundamental within that corporate strategy and how the decisions over what investments are going to be undertaken and where the finance is coming from, how closely those two are linked and that they cannot be separated. Right, I look forward to unpacking all of this with you and I ask that you continue to study diligently. Feel free to look for YouTube videos that can help you to understand the separate topics more carefully. I will also post YouTube videos on our Moodle platform and there will be tutorial questions for each section. I ask that you please refresh your memory on time value of money principles as well as risk and return before we start to delve into the more critical fundamental chapters. So time value of money is chapter two, risk and reward is chapter three. Please can you proceed with those two chapters because together with chapter one they form the underlying foundation of our understanding that we need to tackle the other sections and then financial statement analysis and working capital management are two areas which you are able to revise without um, a lot of input prior to the commencement of the semester.